Hello, and welcome to another Progressives for Immigration Reform podcast. I am your host, Kevin Lin, and I'm the Executive Director of Progressives for Immigration Reform, as well as the founder of U.S. Tech Workers and Doctors Without Jobs. And today, I am going to be joined by a really special guest, someone whose political commentary and views on what I would call, and others are calling now, alternative finance. I've just become a real big follower of because he always seems to be spot on. And sometimes when you're, you're, you're getting all this information and you're just looking for a really great filter for it to flow through and make sense. And Tom Luongo, who's gonna be joining me today, uh, is going to, uh, you're gonna understand what I'm talking about there, but the, re the conversation Tom and I are gonna be having today is really focuses on immigration. Now, Tom is a, very much a declared libertarian. Now, I came out of the progressive left 10 years ago when I, Governor Dick Lamb, Bill Ryerson, Frank Morris, uh, Vernon Briggs, uh, we founded uh, Progressives for Immigration Reform. The idea was to have that conversation with people left of center politically about the consequences of unbridled and illegal immigration in two respects. One, the impact it was having on our most vulnerable workers, as well as the environment. You know, for instance, what sense does it make to bring someone from a country where their carbon footprint is about three tons a year to here where it's over 20 tons a year? Uh, so uh, that's, and it has been really, really difficult to have what I would call an effective conversation with the left. We, I find myself uh, have, talking more with people right of center about this who seem to understand the need to regulate and restrict immigration. Now, interestingly enough, libertarians were that one block of folk that seem to welcome open borders. And then, as I mentioned, you know, uh, Tom, with, with your great analytical capability when it comes to geopolitical matters as well as economic matters, it was really refreshing to have you talk about immigration. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is Tom Luongo. Tom, welcome to Progressives for Immigration Reform. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate the, uh, the invite, and I hope we have a great time. I'm sure we will. So, Tom, now, being a libertarian, mm -hmm. uh, in which many libertarians believe in self-sufficiency, liber personal liberty, and uh, very little government control and restriction, and that seems to carry over when it comes to our national borders and immigration. Now, you have an issue with that, and you believe in more in a government that can regulate and restrict immigration as opposed to one that doesn't. Why well, and how? Well, I don't, I don't really, I don't actually, but at a, at a principle level, at a practical level, I see where we are today and I say, okay, my ideal is peaceable people being able to traverse arbitrary political borders without restriction. But you have to, you have to one, parse the sentence of peaceable, arbitrary political borders. All those words have specific meanings and they also more importantly, tell you that, okay, how are we going to, you know, where, where's the word peaceable uh, in that argument? Um, because this, th we have a situation where we have a world where the government's got a very powerful set of other incentives that it's creating, that it, it has created, that um, encourages the kinds of immigration that are detriment that that both people on the on the conservative right and the conservative and the progressive left um, should be against. The conservative right is against it. The hardcore progressive left has now gone kind of to the uh, the uh, libertarian extreme the extreme on this about pure open borders, which is insane. Because and it's not that it's insane philosophically; it's insane practically. Because right. today we have a welfare and a warfare state that encourage that first displace millions of people around the world and then a, uh, that's the warfare state and then the welfare state encourages them to come here or anywhere else that has one of these welfare states europe 
the United States or whatever. You have a warfare state that destabilizes the third world and then a welfare state in the first world that encourages, the, encourages them to come. That's a designed policy. Tom, of, you, you said something, you, you, I think, I don't know if you coined this phrase or you're repeating it, but I was blown away when I heard it about a week ago. You called it invade and invite. Yeah, we invade the world, invite the world. Um, it's, I didn't, I didn't create it. I think it's been, it's been, been used. I mean, I, I, I'm been associated with him uh, nominally with the Mises Institute and Lou Rockwell as a writer uh, for for years. And I think I heard, first heard that term uh, at somewhere at either antiwar.com or on Lou Rockwell years ago. But yeah, it's invade the world, invite the world, um, and that's a, a great way of of describing the policy at the top of the you know, what, what effectively is the neoliberal uh, political order that holds sway here in the United States and in Europe. And again, I think it's a designed policy. It's what they want. We have the Koch brothers on the right. We have George Soros on the left. They both want the same thing. They both want to invade the world and then invite it, invite it in in order to create chaos and, and, uh, and bring low any attempt uh, at, at economic well, well, the nation, for, the, for individuals at any level, really, they want to destroy our ability to create capital for ourselves and create a permanent and create a permanent oligarchy over top. And it's very obvious the European Union is the model for this, which is an unelected technocracy at, uh, over, over top that and then, you know, everybody else just has the illusion of, of being able to uh, change their government on a five, four or five year basis. And we're rapidly moving towards that here in the United States by um, and this is where I have a real fundamental problem with, with illegal immigration here in the United States is I know it's a political tactic. It's a political tactic to turn red, red border states like Florida and Texas blue permanently to get around the electoral college so that we never have to worry about pesky elections having something like Donald Trump happen. So or it, it's previous really, to that, Ron Paul or even Bernie Sanders. So it would be the Democratic, the Democratic Party would be the contingent beneficiaries of sure. that. Yes. Don't you think on the other side where you have a the chambers of commerce, folks mm -hmm. like Oak Brothers, they look for a large, easily exploitable oh, yeah. uh, group of laborers. Uh, I mean, it really, to me, oh, yes. it just uh, it just smacks of that. Yes, but here's the thing, and this is the this is the secret sauce, right? The secret sauce is that it's a uniparty. <laughs> the, the, the secret sauce is that it's two wings of the same bird of prey to quote tom woods the great um libertarian that the gop and the dnc are two wings of the same bird of prey at the top at the top of both of these, these parties is a uh, is the goal of transnational effectively right. neoliberalism and that's right. the key and they and they're both in charge of it and they and they own the party structure down to the state and local level not that having done um libertarian local politics i know that those parties really aren't all that organized they're mostly just donor lists and handpicking candidates at, at whatever at the level and at, you know at whatever level we're dealing with state house or county commission or whatever and to ensure that uh they funnel the right people up over the course of you know a 20 year path to senator or house rep or whatever and then if you know if they're exceptional candidates potentially you know presidential candidates later on but um that's pretty much all the political parties are. They're actually really quite paper tigers. And if it wasn't for un unbelievable ballot access laws, we could actually change things in the United States. But you can't do so with, you can't do, you, it's, the, the political system is hopeless for a number of different reasons. Right, I know for instance, it's very, very difficult for a third party to get on the ballot in all the states. It's ha almost a, a Sisyphusian task. It, it, having done it, I can tell you that, and having run for state house, Right. I ran okay. for state house in 2002 in, in Florida, but we did it through through using the um, using this, this, the the recent the, the censusing um, loophole that in the years after the 10 year census, no one is considered to be in a in a district until the 2002 Congress is settled. So that means you can run for you can get signatures from any from any you don't have to go to your own district to get signatures to get on the ballot. So what we did was we had big signing parties. We got 75 people to run for Florida House out of 120 in wow. 2002 by just having us all get, get together and collect 800 signatures and, for each other. And so we didn't have to go out and get 60,000 signatures. All we had to do is go out and get three or 4,000. And then we can get 75 people on the ballot. 
And that's how we did it. And we got a lot of good press for it. it didn't, I didn't run a campaign to win. I ran an informational campaign. It was a zero budget thing. I didn't even file any campaign finance um, records because I didn't take any money from anyone. You know, yeah. I, I think I filed, you know, some in-kind contributions for my gas and tolls, mm -hmm. right? That's about it, right? Everything else was, you know, it's just a nominal thing. So how did you but do in terms of percentage? I did fine. I got almost 4% of the vote in a three-way three race. And in the areas where I did, where I actually campaigned heavily, um, we saw as much as 6 to 11%. So I was resonating with people. I just wasn't, you know, it's fine. And that's fine. And my wife ran in, you know, I ran in, in Putnam County. My wife ran in Ocala uh, in a two-way race. She got 23% of the vote. And, uh, you know, and I knew I was making inroads when the Republican was taking at three-way debates was taking where he would show up was taking my talking points from me before I would even start. So that, to me, that if someone, you know, steals my platforms, that's success. You of know? course it is. Of course it is. Uh, the, I, I'd like to, you know, cause the frustrating thing for me, again, how trying to have this conversation with the left uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm the son of an immigrant yet. I'm a nativist, xenophobe, all, you know, every name in the book. Uh, Absolutely. I, Although I haven't got to the level of hate group yet with the Southern Poverty Law Center, they have called me anti-immigrant, <laughs> which again is amazing. I would consider that a badge of honor on your part if you did. <laughs> but I, I want to talk to you about why you would think the Democratic Party, which is the party that is supposed to be the party of labor. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I look at you know my family's history on my father's side, which goes back to the 1870s here in the United States if not for things like the Works Program Administration and things, we, the family might have died out you know, mm -hmm. during the Great Depression. And so there's a lot of things that I am grateful to for the Democratic Party. And when you look at how nothing is immune from the laws of supply and demand, and when you bring in all this labor, now it's not just unskilled, it's skilled labor that's coming in from, sure. you know, 66% uh, of our H-1B visa applications are people from India. Another 20% are from China. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are not just augmenting, but displacing U.S. skilled workers. And this isn't just tech jobs anymore. It's doctors. It's attorneys. Sure. It's, mm -hmm. And what I don't understand is if you're the party of labor, shouldn't you be mindful of this? How, how, as a libertarian, how do you... How do you I mean, I... I, 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 I the 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 classic coalition of the democratic party which is uh, minorities the uh the, the the union vote and the uh, white upper middle class bi coastal liberals that are kind of the 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 and they're the ones that they're the party bosses right but that coalition which is kind of a which has always been a a, a um a fragile coalition has broken bernie sanders broke it in half during the um during uh the 2016 primary cycle and good for him Okay, I don't like Bernie's solutions, but I liked what I saw of his of of, of the anger and the frustration that he was that he was channeling. Oh, the absolutely, same, I, the same thing that Trump tapped into. I, I went to his first rally in Los Angeles. Twenty three thousand people showed up. Yeah, yeah. During the primary, Hillary held a rally, and Bill was there, and maybe a few hundred people showed up, and probably about fifty were protesters. Yeah, it was. And it was, yet, it was or well, he lost less. And yet he, he didn't lost. lose. They stole it from him in the same uh, way that yeah. Mitt Romney didn't win the didn't win the 2012 nomination from Ron Paul. What happened to Ron Paul in the primaries? I, I watched all of it. I, I, I've gone over this before, and I, we'll get back to the immigration thing in a minute. Mm -hmm. But understand that they stole the nomination from Ron Paul. When you cross the 16 percent chasm, in and you should be you don't top out at 21 percent. You top out at 35 percent. Interesting. Okay. When you cross that moment, and Bernie Sanders crossed the fifteen percent margin immediately. Was 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 up against was you know polling forty five fifty percent against Hillary, but and somehow Ron Paul was there. never allowed to get above twenty two percent. And I'll tell you how because they just gave his votes to Romney, okay, and then they shut him out of and then they shut him out of the um, uh, out of the convention. And to Ron Paul's credit, he never complained. He never went low. He never complained about it. He just said, okay, well that's I know that's what they're going to do to me. Because you can't have somebody who's outside of the, um, out of the line of succession, for lack of a better term, um, be, you know, given that office. Because if Ron Paul had gotten elected and he could have, he wouldn't have beaten Obama. But imagine Ron Paul at 78 running, Ron, uh, running Donald Trump's platform in 2016. 
So, he, so leaving, 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 and he would have won the auction, and he would have won the auction. But that's so, a different. So thing. leaving immigration a little further, do you feel that Trump was the accidental candidate? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Trump rightly tapped into. I called it in March that Trump was going to win the not was not only going to win the nomination, but had a better than even chance of winning the presidency. And the reason why was Bernie Sanders. Because once they took the, the nomination away from Hillary, Trump was going to pull a Reagan, start speaking to the, to the middle class union voters and pull them all away from Hillary in all the battleground states where she was too sick to, 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 um, uh, to campaign in. And since she and Obama hate each other, he wouldn't go out and campaign for her until it was, until it was obvious that their internal numbers said she, was gonna, she could lose Michigan, she could lose Pennsylvania, she could lose even Wisconsin. And that's why he went out on the weekend before the the election to try and shore up Michigan for her. And they only got that done through voter fraud in Detroit. Let's not kid ourselves. So, um, and, you know, Wisconsin dairy farmers nearly cost her everything because he won so much of the, um, the rural vote in Wisconsin. It was way outside the norm because, you know, the dairy farmers at the time, being a dairy farmer, because I have a small goat farm. And it's at the time I was doing, uh, I had enough goats that I was doing. A, I was had a small business Hence over the it. gold goats and guns. I also gold <laughs> goats and guns. Uh, had a, I, you know, we had a, we weekly went to the local farmers market selling meat and uh, milk and cheese oh. and yogurt and kefir and all this stuff to people because I believe firmly in selling people great food and and being this is my way of being a part of the community. We build communities through voluntary transactions of things people love and how and you know how do you build a better a stronger connection with another person you don't know than to sell them food. You know, because Nassim the the Talib most... talks about the, you know, Lebanon, the Levant. Right. And how it really, left to its own devices, people just, they just would trade amongst each yes, other. Yes, they would. And, they and... would. It's, it's it, the, everything about the Levant is about oil and, um, and, and then at a bigger level, it's about great powers theory of na the nation state the Heartland, the Brzezinski Doctrine, the Wolfowitz Doctrine, all that McKinder stuff. It's all about that. And it holds sway at a, tech, at, a, at a strategic level for all of the people who make their living in Washington, D.C., at the Pentagon, West Point, all of it. And it's not going to go away until there's a change of generations. You know, the, my generation, I, I don't know, I'm 50, so I'm technically, oh, I am. I'm, I'm actually older than you are. I'm, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I may look older than that, but I'm, I'm 50. I'm going to be 51 in about a month. Um, so I'm like quintessential Gen X. I was born in February of 1968. I'm like the Gen X guy. I like to be an iconoclast, but I'm like the perfect Gen X type, right? Yep. I got one kid, my wife and I live out in the middle of nowhere. You know, we're hardcore individualists. It's like we're classic Gen Xers, and which is fine. And I can tell you that, from that mindset, what's happening in the Middle East and our foreign policy is just not going to be sustainable. And it's, it's almost obvious that the baby boomers who are currently in charge of our government understand that this generational shift is coming and they have to try and clamp everything down as quickly as possible and try and get as much through, done now before the next, you know, say the next election cycle or whatever. And because they realize that there's going to be a real shift in power and a real shift in the attitudes of power that come with a fourth turning, as you and I were discussing before we went live. That's very powerful. And I think that uh, Trump is nothing more than a symbol of that, of the beginning of that change. Um, he is. So, and, so he's an iconic class. He's, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's, what, he's what Strauss and Howell call the great champion. His job is to go in and blow everything open chaotically. Even if he does, even if he's not effective, because he's not being effective right now at actually getting anything changed, what he is effective at is tweaking everybody to the point where they're like they're making tactical and strategic mistakes at every level. Um, I see that you know I see Pelosi and Schumer doubling down on the border wall to get back to immigration. The way they are is a, a massive tactical and strategic error on their part because you know you can you can. You can argue this stuff in the media to get convince some people that open borders and, and engage them intellectually and then engage them at here, you know, with with, you know, dead children and all of this stuff. But you can't really affect people at the at that at that level once they once you're, you've been zip code targeted to get a whole bunch of of, of Somalis, for example. 
And that's what's happening in Minnesota, where the Obama administration zip code targeted in order to change certain districts blue in order to win House seats, in order to, yeah, this is the kind of fundamental corruption um, that is unsustainable. And, and it is corrupt. It's interesting. I have a good friend, Ann Cochran, who has a website called Refugee Resettlement Watch. And it was amazing what happened just here in Pennsylvania when Trump put the uh, pull, you know, closed the purse strings mm -hmm. for all of these voluntary agencies, these VOLOGs like Church World Services and others that would receive millions and millions of dollars in government grants on a per head, which was really allocated on a per head basis to mm -hmm. re quote unquote resettle uh, refugees. And when that money dried up, their operations dried up because it was all about the money. But, and it was absolute, it's just a corrupt oper operation. I mean, we, there's so much information out there that tells us that when you have refugees, the best course of action is to resettle for a temporary period of time close to the country, as close to the country as you can. And then when hostilities end, bring them back, repatriate. Let them go home. Let them go home. I mean, even Angela Merkel seeing the light uh, in Germany wanting to now pay, you know, Syrian refugees to go home. And yeah, I don't know if you saw that or not, but she, I did you know, not she see quoted it. that in either the end of November or the beginning of December. Um, you know, and she's only doing it for political reasons to try and stop alternative from Germany from, again, crossing the 16% chasm and becoming a major party. So, which is fine. I don't care. Again, if she does that, that's fine because that will be in Germany's best interest in the long run. And she's still politically a lame duck anyway, so it's all good because she's terrible. Um, so, you know, yes, but it, it's, it's, it is all about the money and it is all about the corrupt, it is a ter terribly corrupted process. And I keep, it, and it shouldn't be a political issue, right? It shouldn't be a political issue. If we were sovereign actors, this is where the libertarian in me comes, com, comes down the pike, is if we were sovereign actors, we would, we would be given the choice individually in our communities, in our counties, in our towns to decide what we want to do. And I, well, I, I like the spirit of, the, of like San Francisco saying we're going to be a sanctuary city, that we believe in these ideas. I don't like it practically, okay? I mean, but intellectually or emotionally, I get it. As from a communitarian standpoint, I get it. You want to be able to state what your values are as a, as a community. Fine. That's fine. Okay. Secede from the union and become your own country and then do that. But you unfortunately live in this country where the, where the money and the flow of capital and your ability to live that way is all sustained by everything around you anyway. So until you start getting on the, uh, under the, under the program of, okay, let's now really start figuring out how we can do away with all of these layers of government and all these layers of corruption to get down to the point where now you can act as a sovereign actor, San Francisco. Great. I'm, I'm with you at that point. And as a libertarian, and, and, I will, I will help you. Way, get they, you sink or swim on these decisions. Right. And I think it, what it would do then it would, without that ability to rob Peter, to pay Paul, it would lead to much more prudent action and legislation on everyone's part. You know, you, you made me think of the Swiss model where someone looking for citizenship is actually interviewed at the local level. Mm -hmm. And those recommendations of that board are then forwarded up. And right. it, because, it's because for the most part in, in Switzerland, the cantons not in recent history, because it, it, the Switzerland is going through a the same kind of, of rolling up of, of power to the to the the central government um, that everybody else is. They're just getting their last. Mm -hmm. But the can yeah. up until very recently, the cantons in Sw in Switzerland had un unbelievable amounts of control, much more power actually than the states did pre Civil War here in the United States. It was much more akin to the states' powers under the Articles of Confederation. Oh, there's a term, there's a phrase for you that you have. How often do you I hear? You, exactly. you, you hear, but you know, I'm a big fan of the Articles of Confederation. It was you know the, the federal government doesn't get to do anything other than like nominate the names of monuments and 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 sign some unenforceable treaties. Woohoo! Okay, you can't even levy taxes. Yes, but um, the and it would have worked had they not had they actually dealt with the war debt. 
the problem with the reason they are the reason the confederate the the the, the american confederacy the original uh, articles of confederation why it fell was because of the unbelievable war debt they couldn't deal with the and they didn't they couldn't get a, they couldn't establish a, a stable monetary system um here in the united states and they they just couldn't there was too much paper money they couldn't uh that there was too many debts that had to be uh, liquidated there was um and it was and and in in in, in very very simple simplistic terms i, I can't really just discuss you know how much money we actually owed french banks and, and all of and all of that but the truth is is that it comes down to that and if we weren't carrying that unbelievable amount of war debt the articles of confederation might have might have might have limped along to the point where it would have stayed um stayed in place and then we wouldn't have gotten the much stronger hamiltonian constitution because the american constitution is way too powerful hamilton won so you know, yeah, that's, a, that's a different, that's a different yeah, discussion. Well, actually get it while we're talking about the constitution, another rabbit hole to jump down is uh, citizenship, uh, citizenship by soil. What are your right. thoughts on that? You see, again, I, I, you know, functionally I'm an anarchist, so I don't, I just, I, you know, I just, I, I, this is a hard question. It's like trying to parse French when I, when I, when I listen to something like that. Um, Cause the concept of citizenship is a problem. I have a, just a fundamental problem of how to parse and then sound self-consistent with all the other things that we're talking about. Practically speaking, I'm not, I understand. It's like everything else. I don't even know one way or the other at this point. I can give you, make you an argument as to why it's a good thing or why it's the right thing or a moral thing and why it's a bad thing from a practical standpoint or even, or even a morality. I can make arguments on either side. It, all it does is really highlight the problem of creating arbitrary definitions like this in which that definition of citizenship now creates a path for how is tax money going to be spent spent, which was expropriated by force by from other people, from sovereign actors who tried to earn it in good faith and was had it stolen from them at gunpoint. So when that's how that's what's going through my rattling through my head when you say citizenship by soil. All of that went through my head just now and I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how to I, I don't know how to parse that one. How to distill I'm gonna, that like, into I'm just gonna punt. Um but you understand Fair it, enough. So but, but what I mean by that is but it but it it should tell you what what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm talking about when we start talking about these systems that we erect and why we should be very careful about what systems we erect and the erect and the systems we should we erect should be as small as possible governing as few people as possible. I would rather states have their in, have individual um, um, immigration rules than the federal government having a monolithic system. You see, that's, uh, that's an interesting notion because then each state would then have to sink or swim on their immigration policy. Yeah, uh, and, you know, state of, state of California, country. for instance, seven out of 10 immigrants are on one form of welfare or another. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at a state, uh, a nation state like Singapore, who's always been not just restrictive on immigration, but very proactive on who gets in the best, you know, highly educated. And you look at what they have now. They have, there's, you know, it, it, there's from a, but a Singapore also, and, and, and also remember also that Singapore is an Island. It has no functional military because it doesn't need one because Singapore is not going to invade anybody. Um, and, and it's also a very, it's also other than it's other than it's economic liberalism, it's actually a very authoritarian society. Yes, it is very. I mean, it's incredibly, but you know, it's very authoritarian from the Western mind. But as Asians, Asians are fundamentally, I think, a little bit more authoritarian than the rest of, than 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 Westerners. It's, are, it's interesting you say that. Years ago, I met a guy who he had written a book called Oriental Despotism, mm -hmm. and he attributed that to the the rice culture versus the grain culture, whereas to have, have a right build you know rice patties and a rice culture it required great public works to do that so you had to mobilize a lot of people right and it was an interesting uh, thesis statement it's an I interesting about. thesis I, I i it is interesting and i i don't I, I don't know i just know that i just know that you know people are people right i mean people are people they all mostly respond to exactly the same incentives we all want the same things we all want to live in a place that is free from crime and violence in order for us to have children, raise them, and see them succeed and pass on. That's what we want to do. Everybody wants that. The, the immigrants who are coming here want 
want exactly the same thing. Right. Some of them are correct in understanding that the United States did this to me and they want reparations and they're coming here to get on the welfare system to get reparations. I know that if I was an Italian immigrant, you know, if I was, if I was Honduran at this point, yeah, I'd march across Mexico with a, with a, with a metaphorical pitchfork in my hand. And I'd want, and I want my reparations to come directly from Hillary Clinton, who is the one who fomented the coup that destroyed my government that, that sent me on, on, on a, what a thousand mile trek across Mexico, looking for a handout. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking for I'm looking for payment, because what we did to Honduras was wrong. And again, that gets back to you cannot have open borders with a welfare state and a warfare state. That's where the libertarian that's where the libertarian um, um, community is functionally split. And as we were talking about before we started, that the big this is the biggest issue that has divided and kept libertarians as a political movement in the United States from blossoming. It's, it's always been open borders because hmm. doctrine, because you get the doctrinaire hardcore who say, nope, it's, you know, you cannot empower the state in any way. And they like, and they won't look at the political realities today and the practical realities and say, no, there's an order of operations to getting to the state where we can now have peaceable people traversing arbitrary borders. That only happens in an absence of forced, uh, of power gradients enforceable by governments with guns creating and the first and the first step to improving immigration the the issues and the incentives is to remove the economic incentives and therefore right. that means which is away well, with the warfare state and invading and inviting world getting rid of that right because it just ever since the nafta treaty and i was i fought the nafta treaty tooth and nail right i, I was actually i volunteered uh for perot in the 92 campaign i later worked for him for until 1994 then, after the mm. campaign, he brought me on, and we fought NAFTA, GATT, WTO, and it was all this push for this free movement of capital and people all over the world. And it kind of gets into what you're saying, because we go in, we exploit, you know, we use arbitrage to buy up properties, create these factories, and then when the people get a little uppity, we move along and those lucky enough we allow to immigrate to the U.S. Mm. It seems that seems to be this it's part of it. Man. I mean, you know, the IMF is the IMF then comes steps in and issues and helps them support. After they go, we they go into unbelievable amounts of debt through the World Bank. Then when the loans go bad, then the IMF steps in and the governments get bailed out. And then they're and and then the IMF effectively takes the country over. They the vulture capitals come in. They buy the bonds at ten cents on the dollar, and then they lobby the New York the the the. Um, the New York courts to give them uh, to get them paid back at par, so they never the loans never get written down. It, the whole thing is is, is unbelievably corrupt, and, this, and it speaks to Tucker Carlson. The other night was talking about the hollowing out of America. I don't know if you saw his. I, I have I've heard you know I've received probably five emails of people saying, "Oh my gosh, you got to watch watch." It really was it really was quite good. Even as he even critiqued libertarians, and that was fine. I understand why he was critiquing them the other day. Um, cause at some point he's actually right. Um, what I like to call immature and <laughs> libertarians will make really bad arguments like this, but it's, it's, it's a hard thing. You have to like, it, but what Carlson was talking about, um, was the danger of financialization because he started with Mitt Romney going after Trump. And then he just went into this thing about how did Mitt Romney make his, his, his money. He made his money as a vulture capitalist, taking taking companies that were in trouble and gutting them of all their resources, taking all the money and leaving everybody in the lurch, and then using the court system to um, um, to declare everybody else an unsecured creditor of the company, meaning the pensioners and everybody right. else, and so it's they don't have to parts. they don't ever have to be paid back a dollar. He takes all the money and leaves. Paul Singer makes billions this way. The rest of them, they all do it, and it's vile. Uh -huh. It's absolutely vile. And when you listen to Bernie Sanders complain about capitalism, that's what he's talking about. It's the wrong term to use, mind you. It's corporatism. Or it's not capitalism. And that's my problem with the, with the progressive left. They have equated, they, because they're fundamentally Marxist, they believe that economics is a zero-sum game, when it's not. Well, Every it's interesting you say that because when you look at some of the great populists at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, Henry George, for instance, he eschewed uh, communism. He was very, uh, he was adamant about the, you know, the importance of private property, individual mm -hmm. liberties, 
And yes. that's why he gained some acceptance. I think that's probably why the populist movement ended up having the successes that it did because of course you know, it he, he, he felt like you're saying there are bad players and there are bad concepts out there and they need to be dealt with. But all yeah. in all, uh, again, I look at, you know, I live here in Pennsylvania in Lancaster County. We have a large Amish community and that way of life is good. You know, been sustained for about 300 years now, mm -hmm. and they and are um, yes, and they're amazingly independent in terms of how each family and community behaves. And there's a high premium placed on that ability. For instance, because I asked, for instance, uh, why you don't pay into Social Security, and because they're like, you know, if someone in our community were in need and that community couldn't help them it would be an embarrassment to the mm -hmm. community they're not doing what they need to be doing as a group right. there's reasons you come together but at the same time you know it's like the difference between a consumer and a citizen consumers just take and consume and shit out whereas the citizen you have not just rights but you also have responsibilities and certain obligations to other citizens and i think that's lost when we that's what I do find really attractive about libertarian concepts. Yeah, and 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 the our goal, our I'm going to be honest with you. The biggest critique I have is that we're just terribly terrible at communicating the ideas at their core level and in a way that relate that people can relate to. Um, and I've worked really hard over the years. I have I've lived my entire adult life. Once I realized I, I woke I I woke up one day and realized, oh my god, my problem is that I'm a libertarian, right? <laughs> and I took the world's smallest political quiz. I scored a 90-90 and I went, oh, that's what I, that's my problem because I always hated politics. Believe me, for the first 30 years of my life, I despise politics. I wouldn't, I wouldn't discuss politics if you asked, if you forced me to. You put a really? gun to my head, I wouldn't discuss politics. Now today, that's all I talk about because once you understand what the dynamics are and you're like, oh, that's what the problem is. They're both the problem, two wings of the same bird of prey. Okay, now, how am I going to get better at explaining this stuff to people? Because the minute I had my, I had my come to Jesus moment, for lack of a better term, my epiphany, um, how do I do a, 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 how do I convince other people that this is right? Because I know it's right. And then you run up against the wall of, from both the progressive right and the, and the, and the, and the conservative, or the progressive left, the conservative right, you run, you, and you keep running into that wall over and over and over again. And I'm like, and it's I, I about think marketing. And the, you market from the heart to the head, not from the head to the heart. And we all, and because we're all freaking Aspie intellectuals, we all market from, we all go, look, it's logic. It's, see, it should work. And I, no, it's not about that. Economics is blood, sweat, and tears. I say this to people all the time. I'm like, economics is not some dry science. This is something that Carlson brought up in his rant the other night. He said, one of the fundamental lies of our age, of the narrative of our age, is that we can, sub we can separate economics from culture. No. Econ culture derives from economic activity because when we act as humans, we define what kind of world we want to live in. Every act that we take, even just this conversation, is a means by which we're saying to each other, we want a different world. And we're trying to work out what that world's going to be. And sometimes we do it by buying apples from somebody else, as a, you know, from one guy as opposed to somebody else. Yeah. And sometimes we do it in other ways, by building a community or, or you know, whatever it is that we do. And the Amish have this in spades because what they don't have is any true corrupting influences where someone can get power that they that they and keep that power gradient through the application through the uh, the through the creation of wealth without working right and so what carlson was what carlson did the other night i'm like dude i i love you but your career is over I mean, <laughs> like, I love you. They, they will out. take like, you out like, now. Thank you. Call, is to call out the financialization of our economy. And that, you know, he said, if anybody thinks that you should measure the health of a culture by GDP growth is an idiot. Absolutely. Right. And, and there are surveys out there that look to happiness at the national level, the aggregate happiness of a country. And those things are, I think, much more vi uh, viable and valuable tools for you know, diagnosing the health of your, your civilization. I like to say that GDP is just gross national spending, but it doesn't tell you the quality of that spending. It's no. just money. Okay. And a, a debt-based monetary system is, is 
predicated upon a, an, an increasing velocity of money. You have to constantly keep velocity of money, money turning over faster in order to keep the credit bubble, the, the, the credit cycle from turning virtuous as opposed to destructive. We are in a deflationary phase. We have been since 2008 where the, the, the velocity of money in the United States has been falling since the monetary system broke in 2008. We've just been living in this kind of, like, this kind of zombie land, okay? With the central banks just literally just making the world so full of money that they can't, that, um, that it can't collapse, but it can't move forward either. Yeah, and, it and, and it also gets into your, your debt and death paradigm, your, uh, where all of a sudden, well, we need these events to increase this velocity, keep us on this treadmill. Uh, yes. and, and you can only lower interest rates so far. You know, I mean, Mises called it the crack up boom. He, you know, he called the credit cycle, the problem of the credit cycle. It's event, every intervention is going to create a bigger, necessitate a bigger and bigger intervention into the marketplace. We can see this no matter what we, um, no matter what statistic you use or what, or, or what mechanism you use. Every time there's a financial crisis, it's bigger. Therefore, it's going to get bigger. And, you know, in 2008, the world central banks produced, what, $12 trillion worth of money? What's the next one going to look like? Right, exactly. And, and when you look at it. Central banks it, itself. And when you look at it that way, your solutions become all about increasing that velocity, keeping right. this, this treadmill going. For instance, I was at an event where uh, David Stockman was speaking. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, look at the, the demographics. Baby boomers are going down. We're just going to have to up immigration in order to you know, pay for the Social Security for these. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're, you're, you don't understand. You, you want infinite growth on a finite planet. Well, and I, 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 that's a, I, I, Stockman's a, I, actually, Stockman has been a, a, he's also, by the way, a subscriber over at Gold Goats and Guns, FYI, um, behind the scenes. Um, and he and I have been chatting recently. Um, he now, like, re, he now um, is also a friend of, of my blog and my work. And um, i say that David Stockman is a, a great an, an analyst of domestic economic issues but and I, I i will not throw the man under the bus because he has a tremendous experience oh, uh, yeah um, i didn't mean because but, I mean, but at the same time but at the same time you know i know that and at the same time what i'm saying is that you know there's a bigger world out there than just the united states and where i have to where i place myself is they'll then start looking at the flow of global capital and the order of operations of what's going to happen in terms of all this stuff. And that's a different conversation than what it is today. But all of these things that we're dealing with are, a, are contributing to the, um, the terrible dynamic that we have in the immigration system. So from the perverse political incentives to invade, invade the world and invite the world to change the, to change the political makeup of the country in order for politicians and, and, and everybody to, to keep their, their power, then you have the you have the hollowing out of the middle class you have in, and everybody getting upset about that. You know, it's like the, the solution is never, I hate to say this is never more government, but cause it's not more government. When I all, you know, so we opened this with, you know, I, I don't believe in open borders right now is the point, right? The solution is not more government. The solution is less government. It is dealing with the entitlement problem. Politically, that's not a, even, that's a non-starter. No one's going to, no one's going to say we have to get rid of social security. We have to just stop paying social security, even though I've been operating under the assumption that I'm not going to see a dime of social security it. my yeah. entire life. Yeah, we're so in that why same don't we just group. Be with ourselves and just go, okay, look, we're going to pay all current recipients and the next and those who are going to go on the system in the next five years and everybody else after that. No, your benefits are going to be cut in half every year until it, it's down to Zeno's paradox until you don't care. Okay, and that's but, it. And we're going to wind the program down. And, and resulting asset prices will drop to allow people to buy homes and do all that stuff. <laughs> because uh, you see the reason that people, the, the reason that we have to have increasing inflation, increasing quote unquote nominal GDP growth is because banks make money on inflation. They get, they make money on the VIG between the benchmark rate that the fed sets and what they can sell it for and what they can sell that money for in the marketplace. Now the banks haven't been able to lend it a profit for 10 years now. They're just playing the house of cards casino game, have the, the casino house game on, on Wall Street like everybody else. 
net interest margin, net, net interest margin, the banks has been crushed. Listen to Chris Whalen or any other really good, truly great bank analyst. I'm not a great bank analyst. I'm a, I'm a passable bank analyst. And when I, but I understand the net interest margin, which is what, how banks are supposed to make their money. That's the money they make on the difference between what they, what they pay you as the, save, as the saver versus what they make on the loan they lend out. That's net interest margin, and I am. Like that's supposed to be three to five percent, or two, right. two to five percent, or whatever it is, depending on the marketplace. Two in a in a recession, five in a boom. Okay, great. It's been zero or close to zero for ten years now because we've been at zero bound interest rates, and the Fed is trying to raise interest rates into a sovereign debt crisis and into a world that is saturated with debt because debt, it understands debt, that well. the pension systems in this country are all in arrears by trillions of dollars, including yeah. Social Security. And so they have to raise interest rates. They're not going to get there in time. They need like 8%. They need, pension funds need 8% yield. Yes. And that's, and that's and they're not it. what they're, they're calculated for. You look at, for instance, right. CalPERS in California. Right. When they dip below that 7%, then they go to the taxpayers to yes. shore it up. So they all seem to be on that seven, eight percent. We yeah, gotta well, have that's that. what they've promised. They've promised they they've promised an eight, they promised seven to eight percent. Everybody, all state pension funds are all they're all built on the same model. And because that's the only way you can get people to pay into them. <laughs> because people want seven, eight, because but you really don't need, but here's the here's the real thing. Gary, the great Gary North um, from Lou Rockwell, who wrote Lou Rockwell for years, talked about this. He said, in the history of the world, if you do a, if you do some if you do some math and you you look at it, human um, real wealth compounded about one percent a year, up until about eighteen twenty. And then something happened in the early nineteenth century, or you know, right around between the eighteenth nineteenth century, that that started to double at two percent. He said this in an article years and years ago, and he challenged his readers. He challenged you know guys like me who would re read this and said, I don't know what happened. I've, I've got theories, but I don't know what happened to cause that shift. But that's what we've been living through up until very recently, that we've been able to compound. And it, I think it's a combination of, of, a, of, of, of the, discussion, the discovery of oil, which created a energy density that we've never been Absolutely. able to Absolutely. That and plus, though, it was plus ruthless enforcement of property rights in a place like the United States with sound and sound money at the same time. Because what we had was an international gold standard, a constitution that put people here in the United States that up until the 18th, up until the end of the Civil War, put people first. I hate to say it, but it put the states above the, the federal government, which is not, which is not um, uh, normal in human history. And all of those things together, and which, was then, which then started creating this global capital growth at a rate that was far in excess of what we've seen before. Because the, while the world was still corrupt, it was a lot less corrupt than it was before. It was a lot less overtly authoritarian, and overtly tyrannical. And then that's what pushed us into the 20th century. But again, human beings every 85 years or so go crazy. And so we see these cycles, they happen repeatedly through history. We get into Strauss, and then we can get into Strauss and Howe and the fourth turning and all that. But we, you know, all of these things are one far afield of immigration, but, um, but they all tie into what we're dealing with today, which is the free movement of people and being having to be restricted because now governments are so broke and the people themselves who are feeding into this ruinous tax system are broke themselves broke. and they're going, look, I can't afford it anymore. I don't have the ability to be generous. I want to be generous. The Amer Americans were generous to my family in the 19 teens. In the 19 aughts. I'm a second generation Italian immigrant. Both sides of my family. My grandfather came over here in like, a, my, both of my grandparents came over here, you know, in 11 or 12 or, you know, 1910, 1912. They, they settled, they made, they created, they created families. They immediately started to speak English. I don't speak a lick of Italian. My father didn't speak a lick of Italian. His father forbade Italian to be spoken at the table in Brooklyn because we're Americans now. We have to integrate with the society and integrate with the culture. And you know, Italians in New York were lower than scum in at that time, but yeah, we were the, still the literature of the time. Yep. Yeah, but we were still internally grateful for the opportunity that was afforded to us by Americans. And so, when I listen to the modern progressives today say, "Yeah, well, what about this country was built by immigrants?" Yes, it was, but it was built under different. It, it was built with a kind of immigration and a kind of society that's fundamentally different than what we have today.
It is. Uh, you know, my mother came here in 1952. Right. And at that year, we allowed in, we issued 178,000 green cards. Last year, we issued over a million. And when my mother came here, it was a good time for immigrants. It was a good time for native born. She tells a story how she was working in the accounting department of a hat shop and she would find more money in her paycheck. And she said, well, why is this? They said, oh, Nora, we don't have to check your numbers. You're doing great. And so, you know, if you're willing to work hard and do well, every, everyone was benefited. We built a middle class. But it's, again, things have changed and we have to get away from these isms. And like, and I love what you said about it has to come from the head and not the heart policy. And marketing well, it has to come from the, the heart, heart and not the head. Not the heart and the head, yeah. Right. It really does, and 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 I and and believe me, I understand. Now I, I and I listen to Jordan Peterson. And I th I'm, I'm like integrating like, you know, uh, personality idea, you know, personality traits of various. And I like, and I get why people are why what their knee jerk reactions to these things are. Like I I get what I I get it when Nancy Pelosi is is very cynically saying the well, the wall is immoral. She's saying that to speak to her very open base people who are high in open trade openness he's speaking to those people to keep them on board even though nancy pelosi in her own daughter's words would chop off your head and you would before you even knew you were bleeding this woman is not open or this woman has has a doesn't have a moral bone in her body marketing so, <laughs> you know but doesn't matter we're going to say that because you know in a time you know in a world of infinite money you have infinite corruption and and that's where we are now, you know. Um, I think last month for the for the issue for for the for the, the quote for our, our my newsletter every month, I used the quote from from uh, the Phantom Menace, uh, Star Wars Episode One. Terrible movie, great quote. There is no there are no there is no civility. There is only politics. And there for, we go. For Senator Palpatine, there is no civility. There's just politics, and that's what we have in Washington. And unfortunately that's the way it's going to be until the system collapses. And I, and we all want, don't want that to happen. No one wants that to happen. We're all fighting tooth and nail. We like the Donald Trump for Christ's sake. We knew what we were doing. <laughs> I didn't I mean, I, him. I was under I no illusions about who he was. Okay. I'm like, it's him or Hillary I, Trump. Go for it, dude. Here, have some, you know, here, have some candy, go do it. Try. But I mean, I don't think he's succeeding for a variety of reasons, but, you know, we elected Donald Trump because we didn't, have, they gave, we didn't have any other better options. And, yep. you know, and even Trump for all of his faults understands the fundament, some of the fundamental problems. Now he's, you know, he's, he's, he's got so many personality defects that he can't craft great solutions to problems. Right. And he doesn't seem to know how to hire a staff. Well, <laughs> he's not allowed to hire a good staff. Let's, let's, let's start there. But okay. yes, I think that's part of it as well. I mean, you know, I, I think that's part of it. Um, again, you know, the pickings are slim and you, 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 you exist in and around Washington. I've actually never yeah. been to Washington, DC. I have no desire to go to Mordor on the Potomac. Um, I was on the hill yesterday. <laughs> calls it Mordor on the Potomac. And I'm like, Oh, that's a brilliant term. So, um, but you know as well as I, or better than I do, that you know, what's in Washington? The people who know how to quote unquote make the trains run on time all, all live within a, and, and exist within a particular very narrow intellectual mindset an incentive mindset. So, you know, you can't just hire any, you can't just go hire anybody. He tried going outside the box hiring Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. I mean, I thought it was a bold move. I don't know if it was a good move or a bad move, but I thought it was bold because he was outside of the normal, the normal run of the mill. And I, I, and you know, for example, there's a rumor today that he's floating around the idea of Jim Webb for secretary of defense to replace Mattis. I think that would be a great choice. I actually, I like, I like Jim Webb. I, I like Tulsi Gabbard better, but I'm a radical. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but you know, I also don't, you know, it's so, but um, I'll take Jim Webb, but I don't know that he'll get confirmed. Are you kidding me? I mean, even though he's one of, even though he's one of them, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that he could confirmed in this, in this, in, in this environment if Trump nominated even somebody like Jim Webb, who's a respectable man in every way. 
I don't know that he'll get he'll make it through the Senate confirmation hearing because they'll know what that means. And that means that he'll that Trump will have an ally in unwinding our ruinous Middle East policy. Now what? Yeah. Well, and so you know. <sighs> yeah. we're it's a as I as I love to say, it's a hell of a thing, Tom. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so we wake well, up you know, every morning and we, and we try to parse this stuff and then, and as best we can with limited yeah. information. And, you know, I, oh, but for, you know, the audience in, 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 you know, when you're thinking about what your audience is, you know, what your the conversation you're trying to have with people, I'm happy to have the conversation about how to responsibly have um, to deal with border control from both of you know and but always as always as a, as a as a libertarian as just an analyst former research chemist i do root cause analysis of uh, everything uh -huh. and to me the root causes are all perverse incentives created by poor economic policy period Rich. i and i hate to i hate to say this but the truth of the matter is is that the entitlement state is the problem and it's not because i don't want to help people it's not that I don't want to see people help. It's that I think the government is a bad means by which to, to move capital around to help people in need when we should be doing this at the community level. When I see a stat, a stat like we have today, where 10 churches a month in the United States are folding. And in Russia, after godless, 80 years of godless communism, the Russian Orthodox Church is coming back at a rate of three churches a day across the Russian-speaking world they are building. There is where kids are taking their parents to church because the kids are looking for, are looking for a reestablishment of culture after a generation of chaos. They went through true chaos in Russia in the 90s. Oh, absolutely. And you can see where, you can see now as they come out of this. It's, a, it's an interesting case study. And we're on the verge of falling, I see fall, falling into it. And it's a scary thing. And I, I wish and I hope that the progressive left comes back from the brink of their, I think, ideological possession of this. I think it's in, this insanity that's gripped them. Because there's a lot of good work that can be done. There's a lot of good energy and a lot of good criticism coming out of that part of our society that's being destroyed by bad by just being triggered over everything yeah a lot you know it's, it just gets into the isms and uh it, it, to me well, i think I, prudence is important and we have to and you had uh, earlier when you're speaking i thought of that line out of the, the tao te ching you know the man who cannot practice economy can't practice charity and I think that's important. So there's certain responsibilities and obligations we have on an individual basis, but also collectively at the local, state, and federal level. Absolutely. And one of them is just to behave prudently and safeguard things for next further generations and stop burning the candle so brightly. And we probably have to wrap up a little. Well, I want to leave on one one last note, and then we'll be happy to happy to wrap up. Which is to say, I say this all the time whenever we start discussing these things. I do a live streams twice a week on YouTube, Monday nights at eight and Friday nights at eight thirty. You're, everybody's welcome to join us, um, and this will come up when we start talking about these things. I'm like, look, it is important to realize that as much as we want to discuss all of these political issues of the day, and and we're scared, and we're and we're worried, and we're trying to parse what's going to happen next. It's also important to step back and go, how do I how can I how, what can I do? to make my community better. What can I do? Those four words are all that matter. For five years, I went to, on a Saturday morning, I went to the farmer's market to sell goat cheese and milk and cream to, my, to people who hated everything about me politically, but they adored me personally because I brought them good food. I sold goat milk and goat cheese at a farmer's market in Gainesville, Florida, which is as crunchy as it gets, Right. okay? I would have, you know, county commissioners come to my, come by, county commission candidates come to my table knowing that I was the big politics guy and we would chat politics and they would still buy cheese off me. Why? Because my goat cheese was fantastic. That's why. But I did it because that to me is what I could do. I couldn't do other things. I couldn't donate time to my church. I couldn't do it. But I could show up and produce this for people who couldn't 
have other food or whatever. And that's what I did. And right. everybody's got a solution that everybody takes that, that if everybody starts thinking in terms of what can you do and empower yourself to just do something good and great, the politics will take care of itself. I the think the solutions will take care of them, will present themselves. That's brilliant, Tom. And for the folks viewing this, Tom, you're on Periscope. Mm -hmm. You're on, you have a Patreon page. Yes. Uh, you're on Google Plus and you have the Gold, Gold Goats and Guns blog. Mm -hmm. And what, what nights do you live stream again, Tom? Monday nights at 8 and Friday nights at 8.30 on YouTube. You can look up either Tom Luongo or Gold Goats and Guns. You'll find me. Um, yeah, Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns. Uh, we, we do a, a monthly investment newsletter as well, but we tie all of this stuff up, including the geopolitics, and then try and create a portfolio strategy to help you just navigate the chaos in such a way that you don't, you don't lose your minds. Well, um, Tom, I think your work is absolutely brilliant. I became a Patreon subscriber myself uh, because I was getting so much value every week out of what you bring to the table. Uh, thank you. I just... Personally, I don't have the time to sit and, and take That's my in job, the Kevin. information. That's and my you, job. And you do it with such an amazingly good filter, which is <laughs> rare. Someone has to. Well, I mean, look, there's, there are, I'm not the only one doing it. There's plenty of people out there doing it. Everybody, everybody has to do these things. And, and you know, the more of us that there are, the better we will, we will be. And what scares me is that they're moving to shut all of us down. Yeah, I just see so many deplatformings, you know, ourselves having this view on immigration that we do. We have been, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center has come after us uh, on right. several occasions. We've been successful in thwarting those. Uh, but, you know, yeah, it, it's, it's an alternative view. Uh, we got to find different platforms more than likely. But again, Tom, I know my audience has got, has, as probably, I know I've gotten a lot out of this conversation we've had today, and I know my audience will. So thanks so much for joining us. You, you take care, Kevin. Thank you very much for the invite. If you ever want to do this again, just let me know. Love to. I mean, gosh, we go down so many rabbit holes. So it's great. <laughs> thanks. Take care now.